Good morning. Uh, as you all know, uh, today the governor called us back into a special session. Every 30 days that he extends emergency powers, he must call us back if we're not in session. So this is the first day out of session that he had to call us back. And just a reminder that in a special session, the governor calls us back, but the legislative body decides what we're going to talk about and when we're going to finish. And we, have, we plan on having a special session that will be one week long. And once we get to next Friday, I can tell you that will be when we're done. And so we'll lay out today the things we're going to do. Uh, but first, I want to address the emergency powers. That is why we're here today, uh, because the governor wants to extend those emergency powers another 30 days. And by law, he must call us back. And I think about when this all began 90 days ago. Uh, we, we were trying to figure out what to do with COVID-19, and we granted those emergency powers, as all other 50, all, all 49 or 50 states total granted their governors the emergency power. Uh, but I never dreamed that we would have the longest peacetime emergency powers in Minnesota history, the longest peacetime powers, and we're still going. And we don't think that we need those emergency powers. When we first uh, had to address COVID, nobody knew for sure what was going on. We, we really didn't know. There was a lot of fear around it. Uh, but, but now the fog is starting to lift. And when the governor first declared emergency powers and put the shelter in, at place for almost everybody in Minnesota, at that time he said that would, that would reduce the number of deaths down to 40,000 in Minnesota. He said there was going to be about 78,000, but if we do this, only 40,000 deaths. Well, the fog is lifting. And as we look at the numbers, the most recent numbers that I have is 1,249 deaths in Minnesota from COVID-19, of which only 225 of those are outside of a nursing home. So think about that. 225 precious lives out of our population that's just under 6 million and we have shut down everything. No deaths under age 30, and yet we've shut down all the schools, and the schools still do not have direction for what we're going to be doing this fall. And they need direction, and the school districts I'm talking to are saying, we need to open up the schools, we need to get back to school. The kids need to learn, and the best way they learn is not distance learning. The best way they learn is in the classrooms. And so that is one of the things that we have to figure out. But, but in the beginning of emergency powers, when we didn't know, we totally agreed that the governor needed to help get uh, PPE up, personal protection equipment, for all the people on the front lines. We knew that we wanted to make sure that there were enough beds available so that we didn't have a COVID crisis like New York or China. We knew that the, the testing needed to be pushed along, and the governor did well in that phase, just in case something happened. Well, the just-in-case did not happen, has not happened, and yet the powers continue, and that is why today we are voting to remove the emergency powers. And I think you know that removing the emergency powers can only be removed if the Senate votes to remove them and then the House also votes to remove them. And it is my hope that the House controlled by the Democrat Party will agree with us that we are far better off in Minnesota if the legislative branch has equal footing with the executive branch. Right now, under emergency powers, the governor decides what to do. He tells us what to do. And I, I would say, as a result of that, our economy has been dramatically crippled. Think about all the businesses, all the small businesses, all the churches, all the community organizations that have been shut down or hampered by this, this prolonged emergency powers that tells them what to do. And then besides that, think about under these emergency powers, the power the governor has to decide who wins and who loses. Think about that. I went to a very important church uh, funeral uh, just within the last week or so, and that was an important funeral to go to. The governor said, that, that funeral is all right. We can go to that one. It was a packed house. He chose that one, but think about all the other funerals he said are not important. 
I'm going to go to this one. You guys can't go to all your funerals. Think about all of the, the massive protests with the thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people coming together to protest. And that was OK. But Little League Baseball and all the other sports that go on in the summer are not OK. That's the problem with emergency powers, is he gets to decide who wins and who loses. And there's a whole lot of people in Minnesota that are on the losing side that are fr very frustrated. And that's one of the reasons why we think those emergency powers should end. Under emergency powers, in addition to COVID-19 not being handled very well in the second half of that, we've also had, we're in the middle of a tragic death, George Floyd. And through that, Lawlessness increased dramatically because action was not taken in a prompt manner to stop it. They stepped aside when a precinct was destroyed. More than a thousand buildings have been destroyed, many small destroyed or damaged. Many of those small minority businesses that were uh, very precious to their communities that are, aren't there anymore. And now two nights ago, with notice that it was gonna happen, the governor knew about it, the commissioner knew about it of public safety, and here we are, a group saying, we are going to destroy property on the state capitol grounds. They knew about it, and they sent one person out there to stop it. And that one person then walks into the capitol, and they pull down a statue. Think about that. And I hear more excuses. Every way, everywhere along the way, it's been excuses and pointing blame at somebody else. And sooner or later, the blame has to come to the top. And that last thing that happened two nights ago, I don't care what people group it was, that is not how we function in Minnesota. We follow the rule of law, and we look out for our neighbor, and we help each other but we don't encourage lawlessness. And that's what's happening in Minnesota. And, and you know, I've had the privilege of, of being down in inner, inner city Minneapolis, St. Paul, oh, six, five or six times in the last 10 days, just talking to all the people of, out down there. And I can tell you one thing, they're not interested in the police being dismantled. They want their society protected. It's just that they want it protected with good and honorable people, every single one of them. And I will talk about that more coming up here. But the first thing we're going to do today is a vote to, to remove those emergency powers. And I'd like Senator Karen Housley to, to talk about that issue. Thank you. Uh, I want to speak directly to those who are watching from their nursing home or their assisted living. Uh, sitting there thinking, does anybody remember I'm here? Does anybody care about me? I'm telling you, I care about you and we care about you. For over three months, you've been completely isolated. No visitors, no family, no outside contact. And many of you don't have the means to do a FaceTime or a Zoom call. Where has been the concern for you? I want to speak directly to Rob in Sauk Rapids, who wrote me an email this week. He hasn't seen his parents since March 11th, including his mom, who has advanced dementia. He writes, my mom calls and cries every day. I am sick to my stomach. I cry every day. Every morning when I wake up, I wonder if today might be the day I can see my parents, and it isn't. I want to speak directly to Ken in St. Michael. He wrote me last week in an email. He said, we've been locked out of the facility where my parents have been since mid-March. At the beginning of May, my mother entered hospice. Neither one of my parents has the mental ability to understand FaceTime. My dad has said he would rather die of COVID than to be locked up in what he feels like is prison. I want to speak to Arlene in Madison. She wrote me on Tuesday. My father just went into hospice today. We as a family can't see him or spend his last days with him. I'm so heartbroken and I'm so angry. He's dying of loneliness and depression. Just yesterday when I was reading through the death certificates, it is now as, uh, put on the death certificate as a cause of death, social isolation. If we are gonna talk about extending the governor's emergency powers, he needs to do better when it comes to protecting and taking care of our seniors. We have been trying to work with the governors for months and it falls on deaf ears. 
We have known since early on that 81% of our deaths due to COVID happen in our long-term care facilities, yet we are not getting 80% of any concern or resources. Not when it came to personal protective equipment, not when it came to testing, and we still have yet to see any sort of guidelines how we get family members to see their loved ones. Testing, the governor prioritized testing on the street. Over 10,000 tests were given to anybody who wanted to walk up and take a test, yet we couldn't get anybody tested in the long-term care facilities. The governor, with his emergency powers, thought it was a great idea to buy a $6 million building to house the remains of those who lost their lives to COVID. We have not seen one body in that building. That $6 million would have been much better spent on a facility, leasing a facility where we could discharge active COVID patients from hospitals, not into the nursing home, but into these facilities. The modeling from the governor, which was kept secret for months, has shown that it's completely off. We have twice as many deaths here in Minnesota than they do in Wisconsin, which has a similar population. The science and data tell us that the governor let Minnesota down. There is no way that we can extend his emergency powers given the track record when it comes to protecting seniors. And until he does that, we will not even entertain the idea of giving him free reign to do whatever he appears to be in his best interest. The governor failed to protect the third precinct, the governor failed to protect our small businesses, and the governor failed to protect our capital grounds. And someone just has to say it, the governor really failed when it came to protecting the seniors here in Minnesota. I'm gonna to continue to say it, and I will not stop saying it until something changes, and that starts with ending his emergency powers. Thank you. So today we are going to end the emergency powers, but because the governor has called a special session, which is what his right is to do, we're not going to waste it. The legislative bodies have been communicating about what are the things that we could do. And so in addition to trying to remove these emergency powers, uh, we're going to focus on a number of things. One of them are, are what are the things that are related to COVID that were not yet done in, spe in regular session that we can do now. In addition to that, we will work uh, to pass a bonding bill again. As you know, we, we tried to pass a, a billion dollar bonding bill. We're actually gonna increase that number a little bit to pass that. Some tax relief, including section 179, which will be very helpful to all small businesses in Minnesota, including many of those businesses that were hurt in inner city Minneapolis, St. Paul. They're gonna have to buy a lot of equipment that allows them to expense it up front. The federal government allows to do that, so that can be really helpful. And then we want to address police accountability. Uh, if you recall last week, I talked about the idea that uh, anything profound, it, it's difficult to do right away and that we should be very thoughtful and thorough about the things that we do because these could have a generational impact. But I think there's been real positive dialogue among the four legislative leaders and working with Senator Limmer about what are the things that perhaps we could do now and then are there some things that we'll just keep working on later and so we're gonna move forward with some of those things. And that all happened as a result of, of the death of, of George Floyd and the video that gripped the whole country. I know when I first saw it, that it absolutely stirred something in my soul that I would call righteous anger. Or it was, where's the justice here? And then a few days later, you saw all the burning buildings and you said, where, why is the lawlessness here? And so we've had a chance to, to think about that a lot. As I mentioned, uh, I've been down there a number of times and I started writing a list of all the new people I've talked to uh, that I've been able to hear from them, not, not from so much from the leaders, but just everyday people uh, throughout the communities, uh, Richard and Austin and Victor and BJ and Justin and Sandy, Jamez and Jamil and, and uh, Tua, you know, some of these names I've never heard before, but Molly and Nakima, and it was just uh, in small bus rides and in churches and in buildings that they were trying to set up uh, ways to help people learn trades. It was so uh, inspiring to see these many people out there trying to bring their communities back together. And that overriding theme first was, is there justice for all? 
And it really forced me, and I mentioned this last week, to think about what do I think about this? And it really, for me personally, it, it, it brought me back to my spiritual roots. And a, and a theme verse that I have as a, as a leader, and that same verse was brought up to me by a couple of black pastors, Micah 6, 8. Now, this is what the Lord requires of us, to do justice. That's my role as a leader. That's the role of all of us as leaders. To love mercy, and the, the pastors told me that's their role, is to help their communities learn to forgive and that we would all walk humbly before God. And it brought me back to our, our founding fathers and the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Here was a bunch of flawed men. You could point to any one of them and say, well, that, that person did this or that. But they had a dream, which I believe was a God-breathed dream, that really wanted equality for all. For all. And yet it wasn't a reality at that time. And we moved through our society with slavery ended, and there still wasn't equality for all. And the Civil Rights Movement and Martin Luther King, another person that frankly was, not, was flawed as well. All the way through, these, these people had a desire for something bigger than themselves. And we're on that same page. We are all pointing to something bigger than ourselves. And so we're committed. We're going to keep working towards this, and that is equal, justice and equality for all. And it, it's, it's in our Pledge of Allegiance, which we say every day on the Senate floor, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It reminds us of the greatness that we are aiming for. And I wrote that down at the George Floyd site, justice, liberty and justice for all. And I underlined all, because that's our passion, all of us. Republicans, Democrats, all creeds, all of us. That's what we want to have. And on every coin, it reminds us, liberty, in God we trust. Think about that. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. We're striving for something greater than we are individually, and we're not giving up. And so today, I, I want to talk about some police accountability things that we are going to put forward as a result of those many conversations, and many senators behind me were down there, most of them going down there privately. They weren't looking for the media. They were looking for the people, and what did they think? And we have learned a lot. And so, as a result of that, uh, Senator Limmer is going to, to uh, announce some things that we are going to do right now. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Senator Gazelka. As I begin, I want you all to know that in the criminal justice area and the area of law enforcement, it's rather large, uh, a huge scope of information, and we have very limited time in a special session to cover very important issues. Uh, we, we, but before I begin, uh, I, too, have to acknowledge what happened to George Floyd. That incident, which resulted in his death, was not only tragic, it was brutish and very troubling. And since then, there's been many harsh reviews of the Minneapolis Police Department. But that's not the only focus we should have. The City Council of Minneapolis has had years to clean up problems in that Minneapolis Police Department. City Council is now, instead of improving it with professional police accountability standards, the only thing they're talking about is the radical idea of defunding and dismantling a police department. Now just keep in mind, according to recent FBI reports, there were Minneapolis leads the state uh, as the largest contributor of violent criminal attack. 60, over 1,600 attacks happened just last year. These are violent offenses against one, from one person to another. We aren't even talking of the property losses or the minor 
offenses that occur in one city like Minneapolis. Uh, if it continues and if Minneapolis is successful, the only result will be criminal instability in that area and the most likely victim will be those who are of the poorest and the lowest income who may not be able to afford such protection for themselves. Bringing it forward to the special session, I'd like to bring you up to date on some of the things that we've done just in the immediate past, just in the last few years. Um, under existing law, the Minnesota Department of Human Rights began to investigate the Minneapolis Police Department for civil rights violations, which is occurring with a tremendous speed. Under existing law, through court order, the Minneapolis Police Department is required to implement immediate changes, such as banning chokeholds and making timely discipline decisions. Under existing law, a Hennepin County District Court judge has agreed to preliminarily or to begin to for preliminary injunctive relief regarding the Human Rights Commission action. Under existing law, Attorney General Keith Ellison has been assigned to investigate and prosecute officers involved in the death of George Floyd. And under existing law, the U.S. Department of Justice has begun its own investigation regarding human rights violations within the city of Minneapolis and the police department. For its part, the legislature has been proactive in recent years to create a more diverse and more professional and more accountable law enforcement community. In 2017, we passed the program Pathways to Policing. It's a statewide initiative to increase cultural and racial diversity in police forces across the state. It's an award-winning legislation by the League of, of Minnesota Cities. Uh, and it has resulted in the hiring of law enforcement officers with diverse backgrounds, both culturally and racially. Uh, and it's been integrated into police departments over the past two years. And it's only getting started. We increased state funding for law enforcement training for a trial period of four years, uh, including de-escalation techniques. We appropriated over $6 million a year. That's a 200% increase in funding for law enforcement training. And that was statewide. That's used as a base. Cities can expand beyond that if they so choose or if they have the budget to do that. We are, suggest we are proposing extending that funding to continue this training, and it's one of the bills we will be bringing up this, this special session. Under a new law passed by the legislature with broad support in 2018, all law enforcement officers in Minnesota must, must participate in 16 hours of mandatory training. Mandatory training includes conflict management, crisis intervention, uh, addressing mental illness uh, with, with calls, implicit bias training that recognizes values and, and community diversity and cultural differences. That was a program that was passed in that collection of law enforcement required mandatory training just a few short years ago. And it's vital with the events of the last two weeks that we continue this training. And we are making, we're, we're doubling down on the investment in our law enforcement. Another area we think we can improve on during the special session is background checks on non-law enforcement employees and staff that work for law enforcement to ensure that we're hiring the very best people to support our law enforcement administrations. We've also listened to some of the other members in the Minnesota House 
particularly the Posse Caucus. Uh, and we intend to put some of their ideas into our collection as well. We're requiring the reporting of deadly use of force and, and providing and requiring protocols to the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Provides a universe, this would provide a universal source of information on deadly force. It's something law enforcement, the public, and advocates can use to better understand the scope of not only the problem, but of the individual use of that force in an individual basis. It creates more resources for officers to seek emotional help after a critical incident, along with the privacy protections that's guaranteed anyone uh, that has a health record. Right now, law enforcement has limited resources to seek emotional reinforcement after experiencing traumatic events. If that's not addressed, that can and will affect the performance of, of an individual police officer. We would like to get to that that very beginning moment as soon as we can to make sure that we have a law enforcement officer that's not emotionally wounded and can address the next uh, series of events uh, that can be very unexpected in a police officer's day. This idea has been proposed by both the Posse Caucus and the Working Group on Police Involved Deadly Force Encounters as reported in the report by Attorney General Ellison. I expect it will have broad support in both the House and Senate in our bill. And lastly, we're finishing our work to ban chokeholds and other next restraints statewide during the special session. Realistically, despite all the rhetoric that we've begun to hear about dismantling police departments, uh, rather alarming. I know my citizens are, are they, their ears pick up when someone's going to get rid of a law enforcement agency. Senator Gazelka said, people want safety. They want the assurance that in their neighborhood or their workplace, there is an expectation of safety and protection for every citizen in the state of Minnesota. We believe that training Reporting, transparency, investing in our communities with a professional police force has already and will continue to raise standards and help everyone regain trust in the areas of the cities and jurisdictions that have had law enforcement issues, as well as raise that rising tide to improve all police departments across the state of Minnesota. And at the same time, everyone needs to be committed. Everyone, the public, needs to be committed to the concept of law and order and peaceful assembly and peaceful protest, respect for private and public property, and using established legal channels to affect change. We are listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Limmer. Uh, just to, and to underline, uh, we are moving forward with police accountability measures, but I really want uh, the many police officers throughout the state uh, to know that we appreciate the effort that you do day in and day out. There are always a few bad apples that must be plucked out, and that's what we're trying to accomplish here. But just know that uh, we appreciate you and, and you that are out in the different communities and you see the police officers doing their job well, you should thank them. And young men and women of, of all creeds and character, or, or not all creeds, should just think about coming forth and being a police officer. We need more good men and women police officers everywhere in Minnesota. And to underline, we are passionately opposed to any local community that thinks that they should get rid of the police. 
and particularly just going down into inner Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minneapolis and St. Paul, and talking to so many people, and virtually every one of them said that we, we want the police. We just want them to do their job honorably. The next thing we're going to talk about is the COVID-related bills. Uh, all communities across the state are hurting. Uh, Senator Julie Rosen is working on federal stimulus that came to the state that we have to decide how that money goes out. And Senator Rosen, would you talk about that? Well, good morning. <clears throat> As you know, $2.186 billion came to the state from the federal government to address um, our COVID-19 situation, the Corona Coronavirus Relief Fund, the CRF. And of that, we just received new federal guidelines as of two weeks ago today that says 45% of that can be used for our local government share. And of course, um, almost a month ago, 317 million went directly to Hennepin and Ramsey counties because of their, uh, their population threshold of over 500,000. So they have their money, it's been, uh, addressed, they have purposes for it that we respect. But I'm very pleased to announce that the, in a bipartisan fashion with all four bodies have gotten together and we have created a very fair and equitable bill that addresses the local government's needs and expenses and expenses perhaps in the future too to deal with the coronavirus. So it was, um, I'd like to personally thank Representative Marquardt and uh, Representative Garofalo was on it, and Senator Dietzik. And we all worked very closely with the Department of Revenue who will be uh, getting that money out to the local governments. It basically breaks down to a 55% share for the counties and a 45% share for the cities and townships with a 10% uh, uh, economic support uh, formula that the counties need to make sure that that gets out for small businesses and families that have been directly affected by COVID-19. So again, we're going to be addressing that today and looking forward to the governor's signature. Thank you. The last area that we'll focus on and, and then I'll wrap up and we'll take some questions is the, the small business grants uh, related to COVID. That was something that we worked on through the session, Senator Pratt and Senator Anderson really move forward a package that uh, was right there at the finish line, but we just ran out of time. But that is particularly important right now, so Senator Pratt, would you explain that? Well, thank you. I'm Eric Pratt, and I represent uh, Senate District 55, which is Scott County, and uh, I am pleased to announce that we've been able to come to an agreement on a small business grant program. Uh, it's very similar to the program that was passed off the Senate floor with a 59 to 7 bipartisan vote about five weeks ago. Uh, with some really minor changes, but uh, it's intended to help our small business owners, um, not just these faceless entities, but our neighbors and our friends that have invested their savings and their lives into making our communities better. Uh, a grant up to $10,000, no expectation for repayment. Um, we have a minimum of 30% that will be targeted to micro-businesses, so uh, we've defined those as businesses with uh, employees of six or less. Uh, we also have 25% of the funds dedicated to uh, disadvantaged business entities, so uh, minority-owned, uh, women-owned, and veteran-owned businesses will uh, have some priorities, and we're putting in a priority uh, for those that were still under the governor's orders uh, as of the date that we adjourned on, on May 18th. Uh, I'm extremely excited about this bill that uh, I wish we could have got it done before the end of session because our small businesses needed it at that point, uh, but I'm glad that we're gonna be able to, to get it to them here quickly and uh, start helping them with their operating costs um, going forward. And uh, we'll be able to help somewhere between uh, 5,800 and 6,000 small businesses across the state um, not only survive uh, the stay-at-home order, uh, but also to reopen. So thank you. So to sum it up, uh, we're, we're going to end the governor's emergency powers today, or a vote for that. I expect it to pass in the Senate. Our, our hope is that the House will agree with us so that we can get back to equal footing with the governor. 
And as I think about this last week, just yesterday, I had the chance to ride around with uh, the mayor of St. Paul, Melvin Carter. Anybody that knows the two of us, you know that we're pretty different from each other. He's, he's a liberal, I'm a conservative. And yet there's a real desire to bring healing to Minnesota. And I, I said it last week, I mean it. I think that Minnesota has the opportunity to lead the way for the whole nation for reconciliation of the races and some of the problems that we're addressing. Let's begin here. Uh, you can see the four legislative leaders working together. We're going to roll up our sleeves and do the things that we talked about here. We're not going to waste this moment of a special session. And so with that, we'll take any questions that you have. Uh, Tom. Senator, I think the DFL is going to look at some of your police proposals and say transparency and training and those types of things are window dressing and don't go far enough and that you should pass policies that might last generations because obviously the previous generations have led to the state we're in now. How would you respond to that? So the question is uh, basically why aren't we going to do more uh, related to some of the, re the reforms that we're talking about with police accountability. Uh, we in a short session are going to take the things that we believe we can get done right now that's the short term, and then continue to work towards the long term. We really want to show a good faith effort that there's things that we should do. Uh, as Senator Limmer mentioned, we're even looking at actual posse language of things to send to them. Uh, but we're not going to stay in special session for months and months. Uh, we can continue to work towards solutions as we get to next January. But we do think we should do some things. And, and wherever we can agree, we're going to get those done. Uh, but once we get to next Friday, we're going to be done, and we'll let, uh, let the people continue to work towards a solution. We're all in this mode of, of listening. I, I mentioned myself, you heard Senator Limmer. Many of the people up here have been listening, talking to people in groups that we haven't talked to in the past. And so I think there's breakthroughs happening. The fact that we're talking about five different things that we could do right now uh, in a session I think is very positive. So if I can follow up, what are the logistics on those five things? Are you just going to send the bill over to the House, or do you think you can pre conferee or do you expect conference committees to work through some language within the next week? Well, I know we're going to send them over to the House. Uh, we uh, th These are conversations that have happened in the past. I believe Senator Limber will be reaching out to Senator Dietzik. Uh, but the fact that we actually took some of their actual language, and we're, we're divided into five separate bills. We're not putting it in one big package so that they can pick and choose on each one of those things. We're, we're just trying to rather than just try to do one or two, we say, let's, let's actually try to do more. And so that's how it'll happen. We're, I don't uh, envision any conference committee hearings at this point. Uh, I think the nature and volatility of what's been going on uh, does give us cause for concern, but we are going to aim towards getting some things done. The bonding bill really is the only reason that I think we'll be here till next Friday, uh, because they're not, both sides are not yet together, and that will take a little bit more time. And I think uh, the fact that we're going to get a, I think we'll get a significant bonding bill done is, is worth taking a few extra days. And one more question on the length. Is there any interest in staying in longer just in case there's more unrest or more things you need to deal with? No, I'm telling everybody we're going to be done Friday. I realize the governor said we're going to be here months and months. It's not his call. That's the legislative branch's call. and We intend to be done next Friday, so I'm encouraging people get to work. And beyond that, there could be something that comes up that the, the leaders would agree warrants a special session. I'm not opposed to that, but I think in an election year, frankly, it's better to just get through to November. Uh, but the fact that the four leaders in an election year are working on some of these things, and I think will accomplish some of these things in a special session, really says a lot about our desire to, to get these things done. As there are a couple of um, specific uh, that the Posse Caucus has called for that appear to have some larger support. One is giving the Minnesota Attorney General the authority to deal with all police deadly shootings. Uh, that is the support of the Minnesota <coughs> Attorney Association. Um, to start with, I'd like to comment on that. Well, first of all, we're not going to grant the Attorney General all that power. And you mentioned the, you said, should we grant the, the Attorney General uh, power to handle uh, all of the, I'm trying to repeat your question before I answer it to help everybody. but. But the letter from the district attorneys, uh, I've been told by a number of district attorneys that there was real, no real dialogue and they voted to put that through. I think if we talk to all district attorneys, they're, they're not in 100% of that action. So we will not be supportive of that. Uh, Senator Limmer, do you have more on that? No. Okay. Yeah. How about, and how about um, 
changes a uh, beefing up the post board. This is an agency that the legislature founded, I think, in 1967, really has very little teeth. Why not give that more authority specifically to go after, as, as you put it, the bad apples? Well, once again, uh, keep in mind we have a limited time to cover many of these issues. The post board, is it is the issue quantity or is it quality of the work they do? Um, the authority that you're talking about is granted by us and the legislature, but it's really focused toward giving them the direction to create a curriculum that will produce professional law enforcement officers. They don't have much more authority than that. It, it's stated post or a police officer standard and training for a reason. Uh, it has a limited uh, responsibility. Now we have recently added a few members in the last two years or so and uh, at that time uh, we wanted to see how that worked. Certainly under consideration to consider more people but what is the real purpose that we're trying to satisfy? Will it improve training? Will it improve standards? Will it improve the legal standards? Will it work entirely within constitutional framework, which is required. Does that get improved by adding one, two, or three more members? Uh, that has not been answered by the proponents. So right now we're focusing on what we can do in a very limited period of time. I believe that the changes that we're proposing now and requiring the training and continued the other specialized training that really is something that addresses the issues that law enforcement and our communities face every day is, is a huge success in extending that. We've had our trial period for the first three years. The funding run not, runs out next year. We're committed to spending that money and improving law enforcement. By improving law enforcement and making them more professional across the state, that quality of policing is going to rise with it. Senator, can I follow up on your question on the post board? One of the complaints about an agency even like Minneapolis is that the police union contract is so strong and binding arbitration makes it impossible to get rid of our proverbial bad apples before they spoil the whole barrel. Um, and that the proposal is to give this state entity the power to license so as to overcome this blockage that is coming from these contracts. Can you respond to that as, so, as a method of getting rid of these bad apples? Yeah. So what you're telling me is, is that it's no longer the responsibility of Minneapolis to negotiate a collective bargaining agreement? Yes, it's not. Can you and, and it falls into the state's lap. Yes. And uh, I may have a little bit of a difference with that. For years, the city of Minneapolis, the city council, has had the responsibility of signing those collective bargaining agreements one or two years at a time. They knew of police officers that were not hitting the grade that they should. Why didn't they make that an issue when they signed those collective bargaining agreements? I'm not going to give the City Council of Minneapolis a pass. We have to address this issue. Why wasn't those troubled officers over decades not addressed by the city council and make that a, a bargaining argument when they signed those agreements? This would be the first time that the Senate wanted to preempt actions of the city of Minneapolis. Those are issues that are not entirely off the table right now. Uh, right now we've collected the direction that we wanted to go. We have a short period of time for other ideas, of course, and we have the house to deal with. So uh, uh, this, is, this chapter is not entirely finished. Thanks for the question. I have a, I have a similar question from Kevin Featherly. He couldn't be here today. Uh, would you support the proposed uh, DFL rewrite of the use of force statute to make human rights and sanctity of life a consideration for officers before using deadly force? That is, uh, without seeing the details of it, uh, that is included in our proposal. Senator, yeah, we, yeah, on, on the bonding bill, uh, do you foresee that growing a little bit 
to include money to help rebuild parts of Minneapolis and St. Paul that were damaged in the riots? Well, don't tell anybody, but I'm open to that idea. Okay. Long's the word. So, so do, do, do you have any more detail on that? No, you know, we're, we, we're going to come together at, I think we've been talking about $1.1 billion. Uh, I'm open to $1.35 I, I think we actually ought to think about um, you know, well, how are we going to treat this? Um, you know, so that's the short answer. So you, you'd go as high as 1.5? 1 1.35. Don't get 1 me 1 there. 1.35. Okay. Yeah. Make sure. Right. Hearing's not what it used to be. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Continue. Use these. I, I got to use these, buddy. Uh, Senator Limmer, if I could just ask um, that uh, to follow up to Kevin Dudley's question, um, that rewrite of that statute is a pretty big deal. One of the issues has been for years that critics have said that the statute and the wording of it is too subjective and leaves too much leeway into how the officer might feel or interpret a situation. Can you go into detail about how that's, how you would reword that statute? Because that is one of the significant, uh, if not top, uh, issues that the posse is talking about, and it's an area apparently of common ground. Uh I don't know what the uh, DFL proposal to the posse proposal is. Uh, we were relying on professional uh, uh, police standards written by a national police regulation or a, a proposal writing service that has been used almost universally by a great majority of police departments around the country. Uh, I'll have to uh, re-examine that to make sure of what that language is. It's a starting point, of course, uh, by anything we write in the Minnesota Senate we do have to hopefully get that same acceptance uh, by the House. So uh, I can get back to you a little later, if that's you okay. You are open, to, you are talking about rewriting that basic statute. Absolutely. Senator, um, some uh, people are not gonna be able to see the link between the police proposals that you're making and which of them, if any, would stop another police killing from happening. So what's in there that would stop another police killing? Well, I will tell you, I, I will never be quoted saying we're writing bills to prevent something from ever happening again. That would be a lie. We're trying to do our best to create professional standards with people that are flawed, just like you and I. And there's going to be weakness uh, in the human condition. Accidents and perhaps even intentionality may occur, whether it's based on anger or emotion. But we want to definitely limit this. We would love to eradicate those type of things. But I would be lying if I said we would, this would never happen again. We want to make the most professional standards for the state of Minnesota so that the public and the police are safe and they're all understanding and following the rule of law.